Hello, welcome to our talk, um, Both Sides Now. Um, I'm Stephen Locker, front-end developer, co-owner of Happy Prime, and former director of web communication at Washington State University. And I'm Elaine Shannon. I worked at St. Mary's University for five years, and now I'm a happy developer at Happy Prime. And we're very happy to have her. Have her. Um, in this talk, we are going to give our perspective and some anecdotes from our time working inside and outside of higher ed. All right, starting off is getting into higher ed. Why higher ed? One big thing for a lot of people can be the mission, and it was a big factor for me choosing to join the world of higher ed. Um, in my case, St. Mary's does a lot of community outreach, like volunteering, and they also work hard to attract and support underserved populations, like first-generation college students. And I think almost every institution out there has some kind of similar meaningful mission. It's also the community, you're not alone. There are many folks all around you. You may be on an island in your office, but there are a lot of others that are also on their own islands. So there's an opportunity to kind of find them, work together, form teams. And there's also folks like you at other institutions. So coming to things like WP Campus allow you to kind of link up with some of those folks. The campus, there's students give a lot of energy to the space, libraries, food and caffeine close, athletics, arts and galleries, symposiums and lectures, room to learn and make mistakes. And there's also the speed of higher ed. There's a different rhythm in higher ed, mostly because a number of hours aren't usually allotted for a project. Generally, the project gets started and is completed when it is completed. This is not to say that it isn't more or less stressful. It's just different and can fit certain people well. There's often time to figure out to get something right. There are pressures and endless tasks, but, un but usually the work can get completed when it is completed, unless it is tied to a scheduled event, which we definitely work around a lot of those in higher ed. All right, so how to get into higher ed? Well, there's communities, get active in those um, with High Ed Web, the one you're here now with, WP Campus. Um, a number of folks here um, are also hiring authorities um, or are close with folks that are. It's good to know them. Um, there's job boards at all individual institutions. Higher ed, higheredjobs.com also is another good resource. What higher ed is looking for. It all depends on the unit and the position, uh, but here are a few items that I believe to be true in many cases. Uh, they're looking for people who care and embrace the mission. Uh, they want people who want to grow. In many cases, you need a degree, some proficiency in what you're applying for. And then I can't state this strongly enough, but a strong cover letter, cover letters matter. Managing websites in higher ed. This is our next section here talking about kind of what you have maintained. Elaine and I both have been here and we have a few thoughts. No matter who you are, a central unit or a unit with an academic lab, within an academic lab, there are core competencies that you have some control over. The first thing we talk about is governments, governance and core items. First and foremost, now what is, know what it is you need to maintain. What are your core items? These are items that you need to make sure that are always running. Um, a few of note, it might be in a core bucket depending where you are, but the platform, framework, data syndication, all these items require site maintenance. It takes time. Um, stuff needs to be updated. Updates sometimes break items. You need to take time to make sure the updates are working. Updates sometimes require retraining, um, moving from one editing experience to another. Remember that it isn't just code. There's also accessibility, brand. And just one note on brand, actually we have a couple notes, but make sure that there's a web person on the brand team, make somebody that knows and understands how accessibility works, understands contrast, understands structure, understands fonts, all those kinds of items. Um, if there's not one in your institution with a web there, make sure that you push to get somebody on there or push somebody that can uh, get them on there. I have found in many cases, you can get somebody onto that particular committee. And I think it's will serve your best interests. 
Along with that branding, if you create a web style guide, it's helpful for everybody, everyone from outside contractors to all the departments scattered around campus and all the designers everywhere. So defining those styles visually and also adding some of the text to explain why you made those decisions can help them understand details like why would you use a different font on the web than you do in your printed alumni magazine. It can help everybody design collateral that matches the website better, and it can also improve your user experience. So when a visitor clicks from one site to another, if there's similar visual styles, it makes for a less jarring experience. Other things centrally is collaboration and collaborating effectively plays a big role. It's important to empower everyone to do their job. Um, instead of being the arbiter of bad news or policing, uh, making people feel like you're imposing restrictions. Um, a good way to help with this is to be empathetic. Empathy goes a long ways. Remember, many of these content creators are all over the spectrum when it comes to understanding technology and the amount of time that they have to dedicate to the web. Many of these folks, web was not a part of their job description when they were first in this position. This has been something that's been handed over to them. Um, and it's also important to note that folks tend to avoid working on items that they don't completely understand or that they might feel are difficult. Make your tools as easy to use as possible and be sure to offer training and guidance. Um, getting input from various departments and office, offices is also important um, to maintain a personal pre uh, presence. If you have uh, folks that you oversee or at least the web presence of, get, get to visiting them at least once or twice a year in person. Um, I had a mentor who once told me as a faculty member that the only time faculty member ever thought they were talked to is if you went to their office and sat down across from at, in their office across from their desk and chatted with them. Otherwise, they never felt like they were communicated with. So it's just good to remember that while that may seem odd and hardly fair, it is unfortunately a reality and it doesn't hurt to do that. Um, also empowering, empower enough content creators to help ease the burden of maintaining the web. But also note that think about your user access. Um, give a decent amount of thought to that because it is easier to give somebody access than to remove it. And so when you create your user plan, do think about that. One of the best things we did in the Office of Communications to foster community was set up a weekly meeting to talk about the website. We'd chat about the current projects and also brainstorm ideas for different targeted sections of the site every Friday. It helped the whole department get a better feel for the work we were doing. And periodically we'd invite people from other departments across campus just to keep them in the loop and hear some of their suggestions and pain points. And having that time to listen to each other is great for improving those relationships across campus. Going along with that kind of creating a community, um, one of the things that we did at Washington State University, um, Jeremy Pelt, who is a co-owner of Happy Prime with me and was a lead developer at Washington State University, came across the post by Michelle Tarby at Lemoyne uh, talking about open labs and how they were doing it there. We instantly implemented that at Washington State University where we had a couple hours every Friday morning uh, for folks to come and chat. This is a great way to kind of get folks routinely coming that will be kind of core contributors to what it is you're doing at your institution. It's a great place also to do training, um, ask questions, get users to test things. Um, another benefit is just for reducing the uh, time needed to maintain things during the week or handling issues. We were able to ask folks that gave, emailed us or called us if they'd be willing to show up at an open lab where we could work with them there instead of having to do it Monday through Thursday. Also routine training sessions, set up one-on-ones every like once a month to have, talk about basic WordPress or whatever your CMS or you were working on. Um, and then have a second one that might be topic-based, um, something about how you're doing something with tables or accessibility. Um, and many of us who are here at a WordPress conference, um, a blogging engine, uh, post about what you're doing, Act, your releases, activity, give us updates. Higher Ed is also full of quirks. Um, this is also one of my favorite images. Um, you have a lot of audiences to handle. Um, there are folks from all across the country and all across the world, all ages and reading levels, different interests and purposes. You have future students to donors. Um, there's a lot to think about. Um, and a lot of you have started bilingual websites. Um, there's it just, it, it's, a, it's a unique, challenging, but fun place. Um, 
you also have to handle scattered budgets. Budgets go up and down all the time. There are some departments and colleges that do have money. And the one thing I just want to talk about here with budgets is there are some units that have money and it's good to see if there's opportunities to pool with them or to pool with others where you have overlapping interest or things that you want to work on and maintain. Um, having multiple budgets together can help you solve some of your web issues. You now planning for your future self. Um, when you're determining to, this is talking about bringing on some new feature that you want to support. Make sure you can maintain it effectively. Think through all of what you may be required, what all may be required once it is completed. Um, we tend to view our future self as someone that has time, isn't tired or stressed, and frankly, is superhuman. Be mindful of your future self. One tip I've picked up along the way is you should make work to make that future self successful. So to do this, you need to anticipate some of the obstacles you're probably going to face and remove them. So for example, if you're trying to get in shape, one small thing you could do is lay out your workout clothes, just so as soon as you're, you wake up and your alarm goes off, you're ready. Breaking down some of those mental barriers can make it a lot easier for your future self to do those things you were planning to do. And then think about what kind of maintenance is required with this feature. What's the ongoing training look like? Who is going to own it? Uh, we would recommend that all supported web tools, infrastructure, training, have a person specified that owns it. And then if you can, get a backup as well. This doesn't have to be necessarily somebody in your unit. Uh, this could be somebody that's in student affairs, the libraries, or some other department or unit across campus. What's really handy is some of these folks might start strolling up to open labs, and they're easy to kind of start identifying there when you start seeing them use those tools. Um, one other item is, speaking of your future self, is house cleaning. Um, as you add features, you need to maintain them. Often that means it may be something that you no longer will be maintaining. Um, things that are dead and past their prime are, going to, are easy to get rid of, but things that still feel like they have value are tough to get rid of. It'll hurt, but it is better to get rid of something that still has some value than to have everything be degraded so you can focus on what your core, comp core pieces are. All right, moving into our next section, working with contractors which we have a particular interest in. There are lots of reasons to use outside contractors and some of the benefits besides just the resource gains of having an extra person helping you out is that you get to gain an outside perspective. Sometimes that can lead you to new approaches you've never thought of. Other times the fact that a third party is saying the same thing you've been trying to get across, that third party confirmation really helps the project move along. And of course, contractors often have new tools and skill sets that your internal team can learn from. So finding and working with contractors. Um, one of the things I wanna just hit on here is the RFP, the request for proposal. This is the structure that most public institutions and a number of private ones have in place to solicit bids from outside agencies to do work for them. The thing I would like to just state here is if you're an institution that can do requests for qualifications, I feel like those are significantly stronger, both for the agency and for the institution itself. Um, the, uh, the process of going through an RFQ um, allows you to post your goals, your objectives, general budget stuff, similar you would with an RFP, but here all you're looking for is you're looking for agencies to reply with what, why they feel like they can do the work, not necessarily give you exact timelines and all that. Um, and once you select them, they get to work with you on developing that discovery and having a discovery that's worked out together with each of you will help create a more um, robust timeline, a more exacting budget, so you know what you can actually afford and not afford, what can be phased in and not phased in. Um, and it helps build a stronger relationship between the two. Also with outside agencies, it's just good to know that they don't have unlimited time or resources. Um, their budgets matter. They have overhead, they have other things they have to meet. Um, and this is most likely not their only project. A few things to note when working with an agency is make sure your content is ready. Content is the number one, from our experience, the number one thing that delays the launch of a project. Um, now, if the agency you've hired is in charge of content, then great. 
But if the content is happening from within the institution, which is pretty common, make sure that you have that in, in place, understanding that you need to, understanding that that needs to continue to hit its milestones along the way, or your project's probably gonna be delayed. Also, make sure that there's a point person on the project, somebody who can answer questions in a timely manner. Um, it's nice for an agency to just know who they just need to ping right away to be able to get quick answers or to find something. Um, and that person also can play a significant role in make, helping manage scope. They'll work with the agency. They will be kind of a gatekeeper with feedback that's coming from the institution and then can forward the issues that they think are of most note and what work with the agency to discuss those. And also this person, the point person has some uh, work to do when it comes to reducing as much as possible of not having decisions be made by committee. Identify your key stakeholders, the one to two people that really are the ones that are gonna make the decisions here. Make sure that that's where your feedback comes from. It doesn't mean there can't be feedback from a committee. And I think a lot of items that might come out of those committees are gonna be helpful, but not necessarily things that stop or change a project. Another way to help set up your projects for success is to publish some official web standards. So beyond your style guide, the web standards should lay out your requirements for every website across campus. You can specify things you might take for granted, like every website needs to be responsive, or you need to meet AA accessibility standards. This is also a good place to be really specific about some of the more common accessibility issues. Higher ed is just inundated with PDFs, which we know are not always and usually not accessible. And if you include a section in your web standards, encouraging everyone to use live text instead of PDFs and a little disclaimer of why, it can help start that planning so much earlier in the process that you can potentially get some better results. It also is gonna help contractors to know exactly what, what standards you're measuring them against so they can focus on what's important to your institution. Handy. And then now the last part of the life cycle that we chat about here is leaving higher ed. So why leave? Well, there's sometimes opportunities for higher pay flexible schedules, remote work, more varied work. Just sometimes you need a new challenge, potential increase in professional development opportunities. And this has been an interesting time as we've been for the last 18 plus months. Of, we've been in the middle of a pandemic. If you've been thinking about changing a career, you're not alone. Um, nearly a quarter of all US workers during the pandemic have thought about changing their career. Um, uh, nearly a third of all folks under the age of 40. Uh, the pandemic has been a driver of a lot of self-reflection, especially when it comes to employment. Um, it's, it's okay, it's natural, and maybe it's a time to make a jump. You find what fits. So you decide when you're looking to leave, some things is, you know, what interests you? What do you care about? What your core values are? And then even to kind of assess what skills you have and what skills you wanna improve. Um, One path forward, some smart folks have decided to start an agency. Um, this is not always in the, the right route, but this is a route, um, or you can go independent. Uh, focus on, when you're doing this, focus on making some connections and building relationships. And you've been doing this even before you start an agency or going by yourself or go independent. But while doing this, in my opinion, focus on those connections more so than creating your own website and trying to get this visual branding in order. A lot of time gets spent on those, but I don't think the payoff is nearly as much. The payoff is not as significant as when you're building those relationships. All right, so building relationships, where are we gonna do these? Well, you're at one place again. The WP Campus is another great place to build relationships. Um, you may have done some really great things at one university, another university may be interested and suddenly you're, uh, freelance for hire, they're like, oh, would you be able to help us? Um, meetups, um, web conferences of all kinds. Also reach out to agencies or individuals that already are where where you're looking to go. Um, many times they'd be happy to sit down and chat with you. Um, and if you might get lucky, they may happen to be looking for a subcontractor on a project they currently have. Contribute to WordPress core. Um, lots of opportunities and learning and networking there. Uh, there's a lot of discussions and chats and your name starts getting through there. That is a good place. Um, a couple of things I would think, and this is, if you have the opportunity to do so, it's a pretty privileged situation, but take on a project or two before you leave. What's nice about working in higher ed is usually there's no restrictions on doing outside work. Um, 
when you leave, think about having some work lined up. If you have a big project lined up, that might be just the kick to get you out. Um, from a more legal standpoint, hire an accountant, um, incorporate, set up taxes, et cetera. Um, and then go to your state's web presence and look for RFPs. RFPs may not be the easiest way to go, but it starts getting an idea of the type of work that's there. And once you start put submitting proposals, you start getting understanding what that structure looks like. And you have a template to keep working on those. But your states will publish where all the public departments, so the public universities, the health department, anything that's tied to that state, they'll have any web projects posted on their RFP. So I know not everyone has this option necessarily, but maybe you're ready to leave or you're having to leave and you need some time to think about what you want to do next. So like many folks, the pandemic pushed me out of my position in higher ed, and I was fortunate enough to be able to take some time off. But during that break, I really encourage you not to just disconnect completely. Stay connected to that network. Keep up with friends on Slack and LinkedIn, browse some job postings, and do some new projects. Maybe there was something you wanted to do in higher ed, but you just never had the time or budget for it. Now's the perfect time to experiment. Or maybe there's a new skill you want to pick up and you can hop on LinkedIn Learning and take a course so that you're ready for that next position. It's good to rest. Uh, well, take a jump if you want. Um, Indeed is your friend, your friends are your friends. Having support when making a jump makes a huge difference. Um, and then I think we'll move into questions and comments. Uh, Elaine and I, you can ping us also at any point uh, through email or our website as well, at happyprime.co, and just submit a question there. Anyway, thanks. And we're Appreciate pretty it. active on Slack as well, if you want to reach us there. Also thanks true. for joining us today. Yep.